My project really is to look at the rhetoric of gratitude in healthcare. We all know that a lot of space is made for complaining in the NHS. And of course, complaints need to be taken seriously and acted upon. But often, gratitude is institutionally invisible. It doesn't go back to the people for whom it's intended. It's very conspicuously visible in one location, but institutionally, it does not circulate well. I've had contact with people that code the friends and family feedback that we all ridiculously are supposed to do. You know, would you recommend this hospital? One doesn't want to have to recommend a hospital for anybody, really. But um, when people give positive comments, that very rarely actually gets back to the source, so that the people that are being appreciated don't really get to know about it. Um, that's uh, maybe as it should be, but we don't understand well, especially how gratitude is received. We understand quite well how it's given, but not so much how it's received. So um, my working hypothesis is that gratitude drives morale. Uh, this is the, the kinds of things I'm going to be studying. I've got a four-pronged approach that I've spoken before about the letters between the almoner and the Frimley sanatorium patients that have formed my kind of historical archive of correspondence. I would like to do a gratitude audit in hospital. Um, my theory is focusing on axiology, which is the philosophy of value. How do we understand how we value things and what the context of that is? Um, and I'd also like to go and do an ethnographic study in hospital. Also, just to think about the spaces, the flow uh, through the institution. Does, I, I suspect gratitude mainly takes place in corridors and kind of rather fleetingly. Uh, so I'd like to get more of an insight into that. I'm not going to be talking a lot about theory today, um, but these are the kinds of ways in which I'm going to be viewing gratitude in these kinds of this is my plan anyway, to look at gratitude in these different modes, as it were. And uh, these are my key theorists that I'm looking at the, mom at the moment. Um, a lot of them are actually quite disappointing. The whole psychology of gratitude is very much about counting your blessings. And that has been proved to be very beneficial. But it's not then in a dialogical relationship. If you sit down and write a list of reasons to be grateful, it does benefit your subjective well-being. But I think it's a totally different animal, really, when you're actually saying thank you to somebody um, in a, a sort of dialogue. Um, Bakhtin is actually my most promising theorist here, the whole notion of the dialogical self. I'm finding that very rich. Um, so, uh, you know, Bourdieu, I thought that was going to be wonderful. We could look at uh, gratitude as social capital. But actually, it's, he's quite cynical. It's always about... Uh, kind of gratitude is um, a return, reciprocal thing, and I, I don't think it always is like that. Um, but anyway, so moving on to the kinds of things I've learned in education, the reason why I think it's valid, perhaps, okay, this is sl slightly limited, but to compare higher education and the NHS, is that we both, in both institutions, really the point of benefit is separate from the point of payment. And that does generate a sort of gift economy type scenario. There's a kind of delayed gratification, as it were. Um, and that does mean it's less overtly commercial. Obviously, things are changing all the time. And when I first uh, wrote that down, it was before students had to pay astronomical fees and before privatization of healthcare. So we're far more aware, I think, of the commercial aspects these days. But nevertheless, there's a separation. We don't charge students as they come in through the door for coming to our classes. Though sometimes I think that might be a good idea. Um, so uh, gratitude is, is complex and it's relational. Uh, and th this is interesting, the whole notion between th saying thank you to individuals and saying thank you to institutions. Um, because you can be grateful to one without necessarily being grateful to the other. So that whole relationship is quite uh, tricky. There are ethical issues in how gratitude is expressed. There's often a very fine line between being grateful and bribery. And one of my colleagues was recently given a bottle of wine with a card from a student that very overtly said that she hoped she was going to do very well in her <laughs> remarks. And uh, doctors are forever trying to explore this. They're forever worried that, especially GPs who have an ongoing relationship with patients, 
that they're going to be expected to give special treatment in return. So they're, they're real serious ethical issues. Um, both institutions are increasingly reliant on gratitude in the form of patronage for funding. If you've actually been a student here, as I have been, you'll know that there's a regular stream of alumnus newsletters and so on uh, where you're encouraged to donate. And of course, walk into any hospital and there's a huge fundraising mission on the go. Uh, and then finally, a duty of service provision. And arguably, that's what we do here and that's what happens in the NHS. It's an obligation common to both. And neither our students nor patients in the NHS are morally obliged to be grateful for what they get. We might feel that they ought to be, but we can't impose a moral obligation. We are paid to be here, we're paid to teach. Uh, this is, this, these are our jobs. So gratitude then becomes uh, quite interesting in that it's often expressed for reasons for going above and beyond your job, what students perceive or patients perceive to be giving extra and what exactly that constitutes, I think we can probably learn quite a lot from. Okay, so first point uh, that the major thing I've learned is that gratitude requires opportunities for expression. And we're becoming a society increasingly obsessed with the uh, ergonomical flow of bodies in space, but we don't actually allow gratitude or any kind of social connection. We don't facilitate that in the way we organize spaces. So self-checkouts at the library, I mean, where's that opportunity to have a chat to the librarian about the books you're taking out or to say thank you for the wonderful books they provided? That's all gone out the window. Where do librarians get their morale from now if they don't interact with, with the patrons of the library? Buses. You go in this way and you come out that way. And if you're like me, you're always shouting down the bus, thank you, to the driver. You know, we, we pay one price for a journey. There's no reason why we couldn't get on that end and get the, off this end and just say thank you to the driver. It doesn't matter whether you tap in when you get on or get off. You've just got to tap in once. So I think there are minor things that could be done that would just facilitate better social circulation. Um, this makes me quite cross, you know, the automatic check-in at the doctors. It's really hard for people to, uh, to get to grips with that, and it's unnecessary. I think there's, we need to be uh, facilitating better, uh, just overcoming social isolation and loneliness better in our society. Okay, so uh, I've got a clip here, which I hope will work. So, uh, you know, not being a medic, I have to get quite a lot of my medical information from TV. It's a fact. You've got to watch a lot of TV if you're in this business. And there's some wonderful programs, one of which is Behind Closed Doors. And it's a fly on the wall documentary and GP surgery. So I, I learn a lot from the kind of encounters that are filmed. And it informs my science communication teaching as well as um, my medical humanities teaching. Okay, let's see if this plays. Okay, so that poor man was just trying to say thank you, wasn't he? Yeah. And he just wasn't having it acknowledged. I think it's really important that we acknowledge gratitude because grateful people want to say thank you. And this is not an isolated incident. There are, um, th there are a lot of, whoops, let me go to the other version. There are, um, let me go here. 
this is fairly typical in that uh, in that uh, often uh, doctors especially they, they never stop and, and acknowledge it and the patient goes on saying thank you until it is acknowledged so I think it's beholden on us as good citizens to at least create opportunities for gratitude to be expressed where there is a will to do so. Um, in my archival response of all these wonderful letters, uh, so just a little bit of background here, the Frimley Sanatorium, the almoner would write to the patients every year to find out how they were getting on. And ostensibly it's for follow-up about their health, but actually it becomes this wonderful archive of gratitude. And here, this patient had been at Frimley in 1906. Here he is writing in 1945 and sending 25 pounds towards the hospital and uh, sort of still being incredibly grateful for having been treated there. And the almoner writes back so beautifully, I'm writing to thank you most gratefully for your generous donation. May I say how encouraging such an expression of gratitude from old patients um, can give to the hospital staff as well as practical support. So, a lovely archive, but I, I think the, the main thing is that the, the Amina created an opportunity for gratitude by keeping in touch with those patients and personally just acknowledging. Um, uh, I mean, it's incredible the amount of personalization that went into the letters from the institution. Uh, and she was very successful. In, in, you know, people really did stay in touch, even though lots of them wanted to forget that they'd ever had TB. So grateful people want the opportunity to express gratitude. How can we facilitate that in education? I think uh, partly it's, it's post hoc, it's part of closure. And quite a lot of our classes are not particularly well arranged to facilitate that. We often end on a test or we end on an exam. And it kind of is not, not really an opportunity to say, oh, well, you know, this is it. What a journey we've been on. Uh, let's, uh, you know, just reflect on what we've done and create an opportunity for closure. So I think it's beholden on us to actually try and facilitate that where we can. Uh, actually, uh, Paul has got a, where's he gone? He, okay, he, uh, he and Tony, write this really lovely email to their students at the end of the course. Also for practical information, I'm just talking about you, Paul, about your, uh, the gratitude that you get from students, but you facilitate it in a way that's, that's really nice. So I recently asked my staff to please email me when they do get nice emails from students, because it's, all, it's lovely when it pops up on your desktop, but we need to facilitate the flow of gratitude around institutions. So uh, Tony and Paul have forwarded me lovely emails from students. But partly uh, the reason why those students did write back and say thank you is because they wrote such a nice closing email for them. So I think we should try and do this more in our teaching. The other thing is that uh, we need to acknowledge gratitude for the giver to feel it was worth expressing. And we know our students, uh, well, especially medical students, get so much soul uh, surveys that they just kind of ignore them but partly they maybe ignore them because they feel it just goes into this big black hole they send it off say no somebody in registry collates it but we're not good at saying oh actually I received that feedback uh, sometimes we do it in meetings to student reps but not so often to the people that have actually given it um, so uh, one of the things is not to say I'm just doing my job that is not why people are thanking you they've not realized they've they're not, you know, they're paid to be here, but they thank you, you for doing more than just doing your job. And the other thing is that um, what's, uh, when we receive our autumn soul results, I think it's a really good thing just to email the class, and if they've given some constructive feedback, say, acknowledge that and say how you're going to act on it. But also, if people, and we know in Horizons, people write lots of absolutely glowing, wonderful comments, just to say thank you. Thank you for taking the time to fill out soul, I really appreciate your kind remarks. And you'll find that by spring soul, twice the number of students will actually complete it. Because at least we've said, actually, we're listening, thank you, uh, we really appreciate it. Right, so, so this is interesting. So in my, my research on gratitude, I came across this paper, it was recommended to me by a doctor called um, Taking Care of the Hateful Patient. 
Now, it's completely politically incorrect. It would be unconscionable to refer to patients as hateful. But nowadays, this was published in 1978. But actually, it, it is quite interesting because talk to any doctor and, uh, oh, you can't see that one, that's a self-destructive denier on the bottom. The taxonomy of types is actually quite apparent and doctors uh, will kind of uh, give a wry smile because they recognize these types. And you can, so that's dependent clingers, entitled demanders, manipulative help rejectors, and self-destructive deniers. <laughs> And often when you watch shows like uh, Behind Closed Doors, you can, you know, you can just see these types sometimes cropping up. One wouldn't want to call them hateful. But, um, and I think it would not be um, going too far to say that sometimes we can think of students that might yeah. just a little bit fit these categories, especially the entitled demanders. So I've seen also over my years of teaching an increase in students questioning their grades. Sort of, I got uh, 58 for my assignment and my friend got 62 and our feedback seems quite similar, so I don't understand. Uh, and uh, kind of, well, I only got 76. Uh, you know. So we, we do get an increase in challenges to grades. Uh, we've seen that coming through. Uh, and sometimes the tone, student's tone can be quite aggressive. Uh, and, and this can really have quite a psychological impact, I think, on us as teachers. I can certainly remember those. But uh, when I'm thinking about it, um, we actually, uh, when, when we flip that on its head, then it's often sometimes those students that you have pegged first in a particular category, when they come and say thank you at the end, those are the ones you remember. So I'll tell you this little story about this, student, this class I had a couple of years ago. This was a really homemade thank you card they gave me at the end and every student had written a little message on it. But uh, right at the beginning of the course, look, my students in medical humanities are self-selecting. They've chosen to be there. It's they're a delight to teach. But uh, day one, and I noticed this guy sitting at the back with his arms folded, um, not making eye contact. And he came up to me after the first session. He said, look, I'm not meant to be here. I made a mistake. When I was selecting my course, I was in a hurry, I'd just done my exams, I just ticked any box. And then I, when I came to appeal, I discovered it was past the deadline and now I'm stuck with this. Uh, and I'm not creative or anything. Um, and I, 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 didn't, I didn't know how to react. I mean, what are you supposed to do with that information? I couldn't work out whether he was pleading for, I think he was pleading for special dispensation that if he was just gonna opt out and he was there, you know, I should know this. I found it really discombobulating. I didn't know how to deal with this. Anyway, it was, it was tricky. Uh, you know, you, those students do sit and drain the, all your emotional energy when everybody else is really engaged and having a good time in your class. But we then had one particular session where we had an artist come in and he just flipped. He loved this. He could see what he was now going to do for his project. It was going to be on religion and pain. And uh, he, he really got a lot out of it. His attitude changed completely. Now, of all of these students that were so kind to write comments, his is the one <laughs> that really meant a lot to me because it was ironic. He turned out to be uh, not exactly the hateful student, but he was kind of looked as if he was heading towards the entitled demander category. And then uh, he was very grateful. And this is a well-known phenomenon. Uh, it's um, irony-assisted recall that we often remember things most when they're ironic. And just talk to any doctors about their stories of gratitude, and they've all got lots of them. And it'll be those patients that they sectioned, that swore at them at the time, that uh, made a complaint to the GMC even, and that afterwards say, you know, sorry, I was wrong then, you did me, you saved my life or whatever. Those are the ones that doctors remember. But then, of course, the psychological effects of feedback can also be ironic. Uh, and I have another little anecdote. So a few years ago, two years ago, I, was, uh, I always get invited to do a workshop for the annual teachers conference in the medical school. And I, being the humanities one, and therefore one is quite quirky by default, <laughs> I'm under a lot of pressure to do something that's, uh, that's creative and exciting and different. And the theme of the conference this year was reflection. 
and oh, reflection makes your heart sink because it's become such a tick box thing in medicine. It's fetishized and it's really difficult to make it interesting and um, worth doing. It's an incredibly worthwhile thing to do. But now all doctors are obliged to do it and it gets entered onto a computer and somebody acknowledges it. So what I came up with was uh, what I thought was quite a nice little exercise where delegates went off in pairs and they had a little kit with a, a booklet and uh, some prompts in the booklet to go and do things and have quite an intimate conversation. So the first thing they did was to mark on this map physically with a pen their professional journey, what the highs had been, what the boggy bits were, where the woods were and so on. Um, and, uh, but, but one of the things I'd say to the conference organizer, look, this is a paired activity. I need an even number of delegates in my workshop. And yeah, fair enough, they gave me 16 delegates. Um, but what happened was that somebody had gate crashed the session. So she'd been there for the introduction and she wanted to participate in this. But really, I, I had a list of people that had signed up and I had to give them priority. It just didn't work as a three. I had only enough props and things for two. But I was giving the workshop twice, so I said to her, look, don't worry, if you, well, either if you can go and find somebody, hoist somebody out of another workshop and pair up, then I'm very happy to, uh, for you to join this workshop, or we'll try and find you a partner for this afternoon's one. Anyway, she rather sniffily went off. And then when I got the feedback from this session, <coughs> it was really fantastic. It was really lovely feedback, but of course, there was one comment. I got asked to leave as odd number of participants despite other GPs offering to do group work with three people instead of two. Very humiliating. So much for fantastic caring academics being flexible. Made me want to give up undergraduate teaching. So here was this feedback that from somebody who hadn't even been on the workshop. And it was really actually upsetting. Um, and I think, Part of the irony of this is that we often as teachers, if we do get uh, a comment like that, that it, it dominates, doesn't it? It's all you think about. You forget all the other lovely things that people have said. Um, but it's also, I'm actually quite pleased that I got that because it made me reflect on how we give feedback to students as well. So we expect students to take feedback incredibly well, don't we? We've been constructive, we told them how they can improve. Um, and uh, we expect them to receive that gratefully and act on it and not take it personally. Yet we know from our own experience that personal, that we do take feedback very personally. And many of us that care about teaching would be very upset by comments like this. So what should we do then? Well, I think the answer is to really feed in to how we give feedback as well. So what is unfair or ironic about things? Um, it's when uh, it's totally taken out of proportion, you know, being declined to participate in a workshop should not make you want to give up undergraduate teaching, I don't think. I think that's a disproportionate response. <laughs> um, we can, uh, and also that we can actually, well, I did this interesting experiment one year, the students asked me in medical humanities to, to mark anonymously. And uh, so I did that and wrote up all the feedback and when it was de-anonymized, I, I was very worried because I suppose when you read students' work, if you don't know who's actually written it, you, you write the sort of feedback that is not tailored to any particular student or you might have in the back of your mind who you think it is. But actually students are different, they've all got different vulnerabilities and strengths, you know, you might have a class clown where you want to include a bit of humor in your feedback. And you might have other students that you know work incredibly hard. And even if they've handed in a bad piece of work, they, um, they will still have worked hard at that and you want to acknowledge that. Whereas you might think another student who hardly ever comes to class and then hands in a bad piece of work, you know, that's an opportunity to say, if you'd been at the workshop, um, your grade might have been higher. So I think that, uh, that anonymity is, is bad in feedback. We've got to be accountable for our comments. Students should have to be accountable for what they say. Um, but also that personally tailored feedback is really the best kind of feedback to give. Um, I think that's important. Okay, um, in the last part, I want to share with you something that has um, really uh, influenced me a lot. Uh, this is a guy called Dr. Kieran Sweeney. And he was diagnosed with pancreatic cancer, which 
is a very serious diagnosis. In fact, it's uh, the, almost the worst type of cancer you can get. And uh, as a doctor, he went through this kind of journey and he made this very, um, this, this actually really useful video on the way he was treated in healthcare. The fact that people were not brave enough to tell him his diagnosis, it was really a catalog of things. But I was particularly struck by this little, um, this episode that he talks about here. Right, how is this gonna work? I just, I, I just don't think that is good enough. Medicine is not, it's is solely a technical activity and pursuit. Medicine is about understanding and being with people at the edge of the human predicament. Okay, I'll just need to forward it a bit. Different. One of the examples that particularly seemed to upset me, and I'm not sure if it's, a, if it's just me being oversensitive, it's people saying, do this for me. Put your hands behind your back for me. Turn your arm out for me. Pop up on the bed for me. Um, just tell me your date of birth for me. I've mulled over whether this is just me being grumpy, <coughs> which is possible or whether there's something more important. And I, 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 I would defend myself by saying I think it is important because I think there's something about a locus of control in someone who says to you, do this for me. They are retaining control over that transaction. And I think that's a, a, a classic example of being cared for, as in being transactionally involved and not being cared about. So they don't know really who I am. They don't, they don't really care who I am. I think people, I think in, in, in individual, Healthcare professionals inadvertently keep small humiliations repeatedly on patients, and they do it inadvertently. I'm sure, I mentioned this inadvertently. An example which got me early on in my in my in my days of having CAT scans was that I was told to undress, instructed to undress, the phrase that used was, we need to get you to get your clothes off, um, down to your pants. And you're wearing pants and socks and shoes. That's a cool sartorial combination, which I have to say I don't indulge in very frequently myself, <laughs> except when I'm having cat scans. So you're with pants and socks and shoes, and this gown that, that you hope is fastening at the back and not, not exposing your, your bum to, to the radiology world. But I was sitting there with a plastic, green plastic bag holding my clothes, hoping that the back of my gown was, was closed, when uh, a senior radiographer uh, walked briskly into the patient's area and said, Karen Sweeney, follow I. And like a sheepdog, I just got to follow this guy. I don't know what's going to happen next, but you know, but this crass attempt at humour, follow I, just humiliated me. I felt just utterly degraded. I felt seriously upset about it. That he should so trivialise what was for me a, a shocking passage into my healthcare problem. Um, I'm so angry about, about that. And I think I think he was doing it inadvertently. I think he was trying to be. I don't know. I was trying to be witty or funny or something. But you just can't do that. I mean, you've got to be awfully careful about doing that, really. Okay. So um, narrative attentiveness. Words do matter. It depends on it, you know how what we say. Um, so obviously, well, now I'm going to make a parallel with, with education. I'm pleased to say that we don't have to deal with matters that are this serious. But I think sometimes our dialogue with students could be improved. But um, I've got another clip here from just one more medical clip. So this is from the series Hospital, which I really recommend because it's shot in Imperial Healthcare Trust. And it's an, it's an amazing documentary. Uh, we don't often get to see what, what amazing things go on in the hospitals, but uh, it certainly made me feel very proud of being part of this institution.
But there was one little clip that did not make me feel proud, and it, just as an out for, for how this doctor interacts with uh, this patient. Uh, she's had uh, bowel cancer surgery, and she's quite elderly, and um, the, one of the documentaries follows her, her journey. Betty has spent the past three days recovering from her bowel cancer surgery on a high dependency ward. It's very, very important to sit you out of bed and to get you out and get you moving and to get you breathing deeply, okay? We'll keep her very close on you. All right, bye-bye. She's obviously had a confidence hit a bit, which is perfectly natural, perfectly expected given the circumstances. Um, so I'm trying to sort of build up that confidence and try and get into her head that she's going to be going home after the weekend. So I think that's probably roughly when she'll be fit. We think it's going to be the middle of next week. It seemed pretty fast to us, but she's got a good support network, so someone will always be with her once she does come home. We'll have to think that, that at my age, you're really having one of the bed space from perhaps two or three or even more people who are treated in that same time. It, I, I'm in a different, difficult position because I, I think perhaps I should be uh, you know, making way for, for younger people who've got longer lives and have things to fulfill. It seems a bit greedy in you. Okay, uh, so did you notice uh, the, this very well-intentioned, charming doctor, the amount of times he used the word get? And that's what Karen Sweeney mentioned as well. He said, uh, they, said, they said to him, we've got to get you to get your clothes off. And he said, we've got to get you sitting up. Um, we've got to get it into your head that you're going home. Um, and ever since I've watched that clip, I've realized how much we use, we need to get students to every time we talk about our students and education. Now, I, the reason I've got this is because every time now I, I hear myself saying, we need to get students to, that goes off and I change my language. We need to encourage students to, can we inspire students to, can we help students to? Because we do do this a lot, and it's not just us, it's um, those of us that went to Carl Wyman's talk, um, he came to, to talk about uh, changing the curriculum here at Imperial. Well, there's a lot of getting in the aims that he had as well. And you know, medicine has changed a lot. It was incredibly paternalistic, and now the emphasis really is on dialogue. But, uh, and huge strides have been made. But I don't think we're paying enough attention to the way we talk, because that whole rhetoric of can I get you to pop up on the bed for me is an incredibly patronizing thing to say. And we are in danger as we move into this new era of viewing students as partners and trying to treat them like grown-ups rather than children. And I need to remind myself of that often because I do behave like their mother a lot of the time. <laughs> in fact, I have been called mum uh, by more than one student in the classroom. Um, is that we should not be using the language of getting students to. So I hope that when you tune in to the way we talk about our teaching, every time you hear the word get students to, you, or the phrase you'll hear, have that go off in your head. Um, right, so finally, I think uh, the rhetoric of compliance, that's what it is, and in higher education and, the, and in the NHS should be replaced by language that's more tuned to the dynamics of dialogical moral relationships. And um, Bacton said this, dialogical interaction is indeed the authentic sphere where language lives. And it's this idea of um, moral relationships being based on dignity and defending rights. And in medicine and in education, really, the reason that we're here is to serve the purposes and the needs of patients or students 
and um, that is the reality that needs to justify our actions. And dialogical thinkers actually grant the perceptions of others equal status. So we just try and address that power hierarchy. And to do that, it, it really does require imagination and generosity. So I think that is something that we should try to aspire to. Thank you.